You're now listening to the Fantasy Filler Podcast. Where we put you in the driver's seat every week, all year long. In the NASCAR racing world, from top news stories, latest results, and best fantasy lineups, we'll have you up to speed and out in front before the drop of the green flag. So let's dive in with our host, Vanilla Wafers. Week number six is upon us, and it's going to be the first road course race of the season as NASCAR makes the return to Austin, Texas for the third time in its history at Circuit of the Americas. The Truck Series, Xfinity Series, and the Cup Series will be racing here this weekend. We're going to be talking about the top fantasy picks that you want to go with, as well as some news stories that has been covered on throughout the week. All that will be covered on today's episode of the Fantasy Filler Podcast. I hope you guys are doing well. I'm super excited for this weekend. Hopefully that the new package will bring some excitement to this race. Last year, the road courses weren't the most exciting in the world. However, with this brand new package and doing some adjustments, I'm being really optimistic that it's going to go in the right direction for us. But let me introduce you guys to our guest for today's episode. Yes, we finally have a guest back on. I know I said I was going to have one for every single fantasy episode. So far, we are three out of five. Well, now it's four out of six, so we're still in the right direction. But anyways, I have um, been talking way too much. Let me introduce you to Crazy Corrado back once again for another fancy episode. How are you doing today, Braden? I'm doing well. How are you doing, man? It's good to be back on the show. I appreciate you inviting me back here so we can talk about the exciting things going on and hopefully have a good weekend over here at uh, Circuit of the Americas. Yeah, it's been quite a while since I've had you on. It was still known as the Field Filler Podcast. And I think, gosh, what was it, like episode like 120? We're at 260-something at this point. That's how many episodes it's been since you've been on last. Yeah, it's been a long time. And like I said, I appreciate you having me back on. It's amazing to see how much your podcast has grown since the early days and just kind of going from let's just have a good time to – you know, talking NASCAR and things like that. So now we're still doing that, but now you're doing amazing things and being able to travel and take this podcast different places. It's a really good thing to see. I'm proud of you. Hey, thank you so much. And I appreciate you for wanting to come on. It's it's always great to have guests on here. It does add a little bit more of a mix to the podcast and it's a more positive mix that I see here in the last few episodes. So I greatly do appreciate it. But here in 2023, Five races in. We just got done with Atlanta. Here have been the winners so far here for 2023. We got William Byron with two victories. Joey Legon just won the most recent race at Atlanta. Kyle Busch with a brand new team wins at Fontana. And Ricky Stenhouse Jr., probably the biggest upset overall, wins the Daytona 500. In these first five races, has it been absolutely crazy? Maybe a little predictable? Where are you standing here on these first five races for the 2023 season? I think it's been... I wouldn't say it's been predictable, but it's been one of those things to where it's been really good to see this next gen car, I think, finally start to come into its own. The racing has been a lot closer, especially with the super speedway race races and overall just how the cars are performing. In terms of race winners, it didn't surprise me one bit to see Kyle Bush go out there and get that win. He's gonna win in anything you put him into. Um Ricky Stenhouse winning at uh, Daytona. He's always been a good speedway, super speedway racer. So I don't necessarily, that didn't necessarily surprise me. Um, William Byron doing what he's been doing. I think it's great to see the Hendrick cars actually come out being so dominant in this season. And I think that's a trend that's probably going to continue, even with everything that happened um, with the penalties that's kind of being levied on the team. I still think you're going to see those guys really come out and actually, you know, keep performing as well as I honestly think they will. So the season's been exciting. I really do think as the year goes on, it's just going to even get more exciting as these other teams start to compete with each other and really just kind of go out and make this an exciting year. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to clarify, when you were talking about William Byron, you cut out there for a second. You were saying it. Um, you weren't really that surprised that Henrik Motorsports is being dominant here in the early um, part of the 2023 season. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. With those. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, no, no, no. It's fine. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify on that. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I'm a huge William Byron fan, so I've been loving this. But 
Kyle Busch, I did not expect him to be jumping out of the gate this early. I thought maybe one or two victories. I did not expect a victory that early in the season. So he's definitely proved me wrong, and he's proved a lot of the naysayers wrong, which is actually really cool to see because you're starting to see people turn around for him. I I'm still not a Kyle Busch fan, but it is what it is. But with Ricky Stenhouse Jr. finally getting into victory lane at a super speedway, I mean, after the rough finishes he's had at Talladega and Daytona for the last couple of years, for him to finally put it all together with that win, that was absolutely huge. But enough talking about the past. We got to stay with the current situation. So definitely one of the biggest bit of news that came out last week was regarding Henrik Motorsports and the big penalty that they had with modification uh, parts that were unapproved by NASCAR. The crew chiefs were all ejected. They've been fined $100,000. Uh, crew chiefs suspended for four races. And they were also penalized 100 team and driver points, as well as 10 playoff points, with the exception of the number nine car, since Chase Elliott was not in the car, and Josh Berry and Jordan Taylor aren't really running for points here in the Cup Series. Well, they just made the announcement that the appeal will be heard next Wednesday. Are you expecting anything to change here from the uh, penalties that Henrik Motorsports was given? Because we've seen this last year with Stuart Haas Racing as well as RFK, and they got their appeals heard, but nothing got appealed at all. Do you think something may change here for Hendrick Motorsports since it's kind of a sort of different situation that NASCAR did supply these parts? What's your what's your thoughts on it, Braden? I don't think you're going to see anything change. And I think the reason being is that I think NASCAR has to stay consistent with the penalties that they're levying. If they're going to go out and exactly like you said with Stuart Haas and the previous penalties that they've given, I think they're probably going to stay with it now with Hendrick being, you know, pretty much the biggest racing team there in terms of cars and what's going on. I think there might be a little bit of a change. If anything, Hendricks might be the team that might get a little break, but I think NASCAR has to stay consistent as much as I don't want to see the penalties levied against the team. But with NASCAR supplying the parts, I think it's something that's, I don't know how good of a look that is, to be honest with you. I think it's one of those, the parts that of making modifications and going down to it, and the fact that they confiscated those parts and they were still able to go out and dominate like they have. I don't know if that shows that what they had was really giving them an advantage other than them just modifying parts. But I do think this is really going to give the rest of the teams in NASCAR a, a very big reality check to if you even think about possibly changing something to not because some of these other teams can't handle those big penalties like Hendricks would be able to. I think they're going to be fine. I think they're going to be able to still go out and compete and not have any issues. But just from an overall standpoint, I think this really sets another precedence for everybody else that if you're going to try to mess with anything on the car, that it's, it's really going to cost you. And, you know, what is your, what is your winning? How much are you willing to go out and push the envelope to try to make these cars faster with them? bringing out with on the next gen car there's an old saying in nascar if you ain't cheating you ain't winning but in this situation He's nascar yeah and nascar has decided to um put a big foot down on this situation like absolutely not we, we are not playing this game anymore so nascar set the precedent and we're hoping that it stays the same. I'm personally hoping it, even though, yes, my drivers are the ones that are getting affected the most on this. I don't want to see something different because then the stories and theories all start leaking in on, they start becoming more true that NASCAR is more biased towards Henrik Motorsports. And we don't want that situation here in this sport. We want to feel like everyone has an equal shot. And if you have a situation where they come to the appeal and it's kind of like a flimsy excuse on why it was modified and they get away with it, that's just going to add some fuel to the fire. That's my personal beliefs. I know a lot of people out there may think differently on it, but I kind of hope that the penalty stays if it is an actual infraction and it was a modification on their part. If not, then we got an interesting case here to say the least. But if everything looks the way it does right now, it needs to stay. The penalty needs to stay, whether or not they um, do good in the appeal. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. If they try to go out there and they give Hendricks a break, it's going to bring everybody out exactly. that Hey, NASCAR wants Hendricks to do well because if Hendricks does well, NASCAR does well. The whole point of this next-gen car was to bring the racing closer together to help the small teams that don't have as much funding as Hendricks does to still be able to go out there and compete. And if you're trying to go out there and make changes to these cars because you have the budget to be able to do it, 
then it's not fair to the smaller teams. And I think they absolutely need to stay with that penalty and let everybody know that you're not going to make changes to the car. You're not going to try to gain an advantage if it's not within the rules. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for adding on to that. Um, also a bit of news that we have, we're going to move on to next that I think we should cover. We're going to do these real quickly, but then we're going to stop on one specific because it was a, just so talked about for um, the entire week. And I really do just enjoy talking about it. Uh, big news here regarding with Kevin Harvick at North Wilkesboro in the all-star race. He will not be driving the number four car. In fact, he's going to be driving a tribute car to his first ever victory in the NASCAR cup series. He will be driving the number 29 car in the all-star race at North Wilkesboro and at North Wilkesboro right now they are doing tire test sessions and it's just such an awe to see those cars back at that track first time in god what has it been um almost 27 years they've been they've been away from that track no one thought yes. that North Wilkesboro yeah no one thought that this track was going to come back and we're having tire tests for an all-star race and a truck series race. Remember, it's just not just this expedition race. We're going to actually have a points paying race in the truck series at North Wilkesboro. Such a crazy, crazy thing to happen here. And no one saw that one coming. And it may not be the only track that gets a revival because Nashville Fairgrounds just got the approval by the county to keep going forward with renovations. So maybe, just maybe in the future, Nashville Fairgrounds will be added to the schedule in NASCAR, whether it's down the Truck Series, Xfinity Series, or the Cup Series. But the biggest bit of news that I wanted to cover on real quickly was with Josh Williams in the Xfinity race. You, you Braden, you're, you're familiar with the Josh Williams incident, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, everyone's been talking about this. So if you guys aren't uh, aware of this, if you guys missed this weekend, uh, Josh Williams got parked after debris fell off his car to extend the caution. Now, it's not really the team's fault. Yes, they probably were rushing it to try to make sure that they beat the time clock, so if they failed on the clock, they would have to go behind the garage. They were out for the race. So there was probably some speed to try to get that car put together. But the bear bomb would not stick because it was such a cold day out at Atlanta. So they were having a hard time having that stick, and then debris flies off, and usually... They could get penalized, maybe a lap or two. That's always devastating. Instead, NASCAR says, you know what? You're parking it. You're done for the day. He was so upset about it that he decided to park the car at the start-finish line, throw out the peace sign, and walk to the garage area. NASCAR held him in the hauler for the entire race distance, and then he was finally let go. But it was just announced earlier this week that, unfortunately for all the Josh Williams fans... He is suspended for one race, so we will not see him at Circuit of the Americas. Alex LeBay will be coming into the car, replacing him in that number 92 machine. Braden, I've talked to Josh Williams, such a nice guy in person. Like, he really is a down-to-earth, amazing guy. The incident that happened here was definitely a rough one. A lot of people are on Josh Williams' side. But do you believe he should have been suspended this weekend? I don't think he should have been suspended. Now, that's just me being a fan, right? I mean, if you're looking at it from a, you know, a legitimate standpoint, then it doesn't surprise me that they were going to do that. Again, this is coming from NASCAR, I think, trying to set a precedent so they're not going to let them just kind of have free reign. I know they will to an extent. Um, but with the overall change in what he was doing, I, I agree with where he's coming from. I 100% am with josh when it comes to all of this he if any other situation i understand where he's coming from but with the debris it's like oh hey here's you know one or two laps we're not going to completely take you out of the race and ruin your entire weekend but for them to go out there and do that and to, to a smaller budget team like that it's tough to try to go out there and make that work i mean these guys you know make or break on every single week and with them doing this i from a fan perspective, I absolutely love it. I loved what he did going out there and putting it. And I also thought it was hilarious that Denny Hamlin was like, yeah, I'll pay your fine. No problem. Yeah. Just trying to kind of stick it to the guys a little bit um, from an overall standpoint. But it's just one of those things that I get it. I understand where they're coming from. They don't want him to go out there and, you know, cause a scene and things like that. But I also think this is good for NASCAR because you're getting a guy that's coming out there that's willing to stick to his – his morals and what he thinks is wrong and right. He's not going to kind of bend over backwards just because he's a, a small person team. I don't know if you would have seen the same concept if say a, you know, a Hendrix Motorsports or something like that were to do something of this extent, they may or may not have 
done the whole thing. So I love what he did. I think it brings a lot of fire and passion and shows that he's, that he wants to go out here and compete and they want to go out there and try to win. And missing one race, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. I think he's going to come back as, you know, as strong as he can and bring that car back out and start to compete. Yeah. You know what? I, I totally get where people are coming from. And I just became a Josh. I, well, I've always kind of been a Josh Williams fan because talking to him, I knew he was a really cool guy. And then afterwards with this incident, then I really became a Josh Williams fan. And I think there's a lot of people listening that uh, are in the same boat as you. I'm on the other side here. I feel like a suspension needed to happen because unfortunately it was an emotional move. Like, yeah, he, he could be angry. He could vent out his frustration. But to park the car right there and just basically interfere with a race as a whole, I get where NASCAR is coming from. You, you you could try to compare it to one thing or another. I think the best comparison, but it's still comparing an apple to an orange, is the Bubba Wallace situation where you had an incident happen on the racetrack and he wrecks out his car. But at the same time, he... Um, blocks the track with because of the wreck he gets out of the car walks the pit road doesn't refuses to go with the safety team it, it's just a bad look on nascar no matter which way you look at it whether you're on the side of the driver or not and if josh williams is able to get away with that if he doesn't even get fined and they just move on like uh, it is what it is then it opens the door for other drivers to kind of just rebel and i'm pretty sure nascar's a little afraid now by all means, voice your opinion. I really love that. That's that's the trouble we have with uh, drivers nowadays. They're kind of like this straight edge. They don't really cause any controversy. They don't really have an opinion on anything. I love having someone with a personality. It's just yeah, with this situation. I agree. Yeah, but the, the thing I'm worried about is you can't just have a driver just straight rebel or someone to just do whatever they want on the track because then you look unprofessional as a sport. So – Yes, I hate that he's suspended. I think NASCAR made the right call. Either way, though, it's a win for Josh Williams and DGM Racing because their social media platforms doubled overnight. And I think everyone's brought a lot of attention to the smaller team. And hopefully, Josh Williams, we've seen the talent he has with DGM Racing. That pair has just worked really well. Wasn't the same with BJ McLeod Motorsports. But here at DGM, they just click right. Sometimes you just need to find the right duo to make things work. And I, I feel like the, in the rest of 2023, they're going to have some good finishes here and there. Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with that. And, you're, and I'm right there with you. As a fan standpoint, I love, you know, like you said, going out there and voicing your opinion. Was that done in the greatest of ways? Probably not. You know, it's a heat of the moment situation. He's trying to go out there and race. And when that happens, I mean, I get it. I understand where he's coming from. But you're exactly right in the fact that these drivers don't go out there and voice their opinions as much as I think they should. I think it all ties back into sponsorship and things like that. They don't want to lose money if they go out there and voice their opinion. So it gets tough for them to kind of say how they really feel without worrying about the repercussions that are going to come their way. But and, I, I 100% agree with that. And the funny thing about the sponsorship is this was completely different from anything I've ever seen in NASCAR, where sponsorships will usually apologize for something like that. Not with Josh Williams' sponsorships. They were like, hell yeah, that's our driver right there. That was very cool to see on social media. I respect the hell out of his sponsors. Um, I'm trying to think of, of – I know Cool Ray was on the car, and a lot of people um, were super pumped about Cool Ray just sticking with them. But there was another sponsor that they had also on social media like that's our driver and that's the coolest thing ever so respect to all those sponsors we can go on and on with the, the josh williams situation but i, I think right now we got to move we got to shift forward we've we stuck on a lot of news stories here this week we got to focus on the most important thing that a lot of people tune into these episodes and that is our top fantasy picks here for circuit of the americas First road course of the season, a lot of people are trying to figure out which drivers do they want to go with, which drivers are best to sit out, who do you want to take a gamble on? Big names here in this race. So super exciting. Without further ado, let's dive into it. Here is our top fantasy picks for the Eco Park Texas Grand Prix at Circuit of the Americas. Alrighty, guys, so you already know how fantasy picks work. You have six drivers in your lineup. Five of them 
will count towards your points while you'll have one in the garage area. You can only use one driver 10 times throughout the regular season. So 26 races. So you got to be smart on who you go with. You just don't want to go with the top drivers every single race for the first 10 because there could be a chance that they do better during the summer stretch. And then who do you have else to put on your fantasy roster? So you got to be very smart with your picks. Now, here in this road course race, you're going to have a lot of drivers that you don't really think about when it comes to the intermediate tracks and short tracks and the super speedways. That's the great thing about Circuit of the Americas. With that being said, you could be in a make or break situation. Some interesting things that we should cover on before we start diving into these drivers is this race will have not only the choose rule, which we've never seen at road courses before, but there's going to be no caution at the end of the stages. So happy about that because there was a lot of people sacrificing stage points, so we don't get, got to really worry about that at all. We just got to focus on the talent and some of the pit strategies that we will see here in this race that don't that will not be affected because of when the stage ends. Uh, Brayden, I'm pretty sure you're very happy about that, that we will not see a caution at the end of the stages because it really ruined a lot of the strategies that played out here at road courses, especially at the bigger tracks, like here at Circuit of the Americas and Road America last year. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's nice to see that we're going to be able to keep the, the overall pace of the race still going. So if you've got one of these guys that are out there leading laps, leading the race and going out there, and if they're just dominating the race, and then the stage break comes along, and then all of a sudden, you know, it disrupts the flow, and you get these other guys that would base their strategy off of, the playoff points and the stage points and trying to figure out, okay, where do I want to go with this here? I think this kind of gets back to the old, old school style NASCAR racing when there was no, you know, stages, there were no playoff points. There were no stage points. You were just basing how you were going to race off the rest of the day and how your team's going. So I think this is going to be great to see, keep the flow going. And if anybody can go out there and capitalize, it's not going to be the end of the world. If you're at the end of the stage and the caution comes out, you can still go out there and try to work on your car and keep the race running. Yeah. And by the way, I just want to cover this real quickly. Stage two, here was your top three of stage two last year here at Circuit of the Americas. I don't think this is going to be the same thing that we see here this year. But because of these cautions, here are the ones who finished in the top three. Denny Hamlin, Kyle Busch, and Joey Logano finished first, second, and third in stage number two. They finished, Denny Hamlin finished 18th. Kyle Busch finished 28th, and Joey Logano, he finished back there, well, I'm trying to remember, 31st. I just found it right here on my side. So we don't got to worry about that where you got to sacrifice a driver to get those stage points. So thank goodness for that. So let's dive into it. We're, so five drivers we're going to talk about here. I'm going to try to include a Chevy, a Ford, and a Toyota, and then the other two, they're just going to be extras. Brayden, you're the guest of the show. Who do you think is going to be a top pick that will not only score stage points, but will be a factor to win this race? My first pick that I'm going to go with is going to be Ross Chastain. Reason being is I feel like with his car, he has been one of the dominant races so far over this season. And out of the races that they've had at Circuit of the Americas so far, he's finished top 10 in both races that they've had over the, se the last two years at Circuit of the Americas. So he knows how to get the job done. He knows how to run up front. I think with the car and the performance that he has, I feel like we've seen he's not afraid to go out there and lay it on the line. Clearly, we saw that in Martinsville last year with the race. I think Ross can go out there. If he can stay up front, and I think if he can keep his head cool, I think he has a tendency to run a little bit hot sometimes, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I think with the Circuit of the Americas, he's going to be able to stay consistent, and he's honestly going to be one of my favorites to kind of stay out front and lead laps as long as everything kind of stays together and he can keep his cool. Love that pick. He has the best averages here at Circuit of the Americas. Last two races here. By the way, different teams. Chip Ganassi Racing and track house racing first and fourth lead laps in both of those clearly the most dominant car and provided us with probably the best finish of 2022 love the pick with ross chastain nothing seems to be sh uh, slowing him down and i'm pretty sure if you look at practice and qualifying hopefully we are able to do that i think they're they're doing it on saturday so we don't got to worry about weather problems there but yeah i agree as of right now ross chastain looks like a top pick amazing one to go with now let's talk about the fords here so the fords finally got their first victory of the season joey logano was able to get into victory lane and which was kind of surprising because he struggled at vegas 
and Phoenix, tracks that we thought he would do really good at. Then he came back and did really well at Atlanta. But we're not talking about Joey Logano here as the top pick. I think the top pick for the Fords is the driver who scored just as many stage points as he did in that Atlanta race. I'm talking about Austin Sindrick. Austin Sindrick's been kind of a sleeper right now, and not many people have been really focusing on him. I think it's time to put Austin Sindrick as a top pick. I know people haven't used him that much, but when it comes to these road courses, ever since he was a rookie running a part-time schedule, always ran good, led laps in both of the Circuit of the America races. He's hands down a top Ford pick for me here this weekend. And for the Toyotas, I got a good pick here, but let's hear from Braden. I, I'm going to give you the top Toyota pick. First off, do you like Austin Cindric? And then tell me your Toyota pick. <laughs> yeah, I think Austin Cindric is a great pick. If he's going to go out there with the Fords, I think he's going to be one of the leading packs. If he's going to go up, the only other person I would say in a Ford that might be able to go out there and really compete with him is going to be Ryan Blaney, just because of the confidence I think he has out there in road courses. I don't think people think of him as a road course racer, but I, I think he can go out there and race really well. He kind of, he has a tendency to keep more of a cool head. And that's really big for me on these road course races because I feel like people can start to get frustrated. You know, the whole Rubbins racing thing here really starts to make sense with those. Um, so yeah, love your pick with the Ford. My top Toyota, to be honest, is it's honestly going to be Tyler Reddick. And I, the reason why I like Tyler Reddick is I think with him coming out there being – not as experienced as I would say, you know, in the cup series as everybody else. I think he's not going to go out there with, I would say any disregard. I think he's going to go out there and he's not going to race scared. He's going to be able to go out there and keep everything consistent. He doesn't have any fear. I think the Toyotas on that side, I don't know if they've necessarily been considered a, you know, a high end road course package. I do think with the new one that NASCAR is bringing on, this kind of keeps it to a level playing field. But I just love where Tyler Reddick is. I think he's going to be able to go out there and keep things consistent and have a great race. Toyota's really struggled last year. I totally get that. But the one person who did not struggle at all last year, granted it was with another team, was Tyler Reddick. Let's throw out Sonoma. I think he suffered mechanical problems at Sonoma. So that that's not really going to be um, added as a kind of a bad finish for him because he qualified fifth of that race. So he probably would have done really good in that one. But anyways... Here's the last road courses last year, minus Sonoma. One at Road of the America, uh, Road America. One at the Indy Road Course. Top 10 at Watkins Glen. Top 10 at Charlotte Roble. And a top five finish at Coda. And he was able to lead laps in every single one of them. He's clearly shown that he is a great driver to go with here at these road courses. Whether or not Toyotas are struggling. Now, it might be a good idea to look at practice and qualify and see where the Toyotas are measuring up at. Kind of will play a little bit of a factor. But overall, I mean, you just can't count him out by just how much success he had last year. Shown that talent. And if anyone's going to lead the Toyota Brigade to victory lane, I'm with you. Tyler Reddick's a great one to go with in that number 45 car. We got two more spots here as far as top picks go. I'm going to throw two out there, and then, Braden, if you want to, you can throw two out there. It's totally up to you. But we're going to stay with Chevrolets here. And the two Chevrolets I want to talk about is one from Hendrick Motorsports and one from Colleague Racing. Yep, two teams that got penalized after the Phoenix race. We got to include them here on this list. You got to th- consider... Alex Bowman in the number 48 and AJ Allmendinger in the number 16. And there's a good reason why. These two drivers were in the mix at the very end of that Coda race. Unfortunately for AJ Allmendinger, he got taken out in the final last corners because it was just a spectacular finish. Three drivers had an opportunity. Unfortunate for him that Ross Chastain bumped into him too hard. He spun out. But still, he was a factor in that race. Ran really good. The race before then, when he was running also a part-time schedule, he was able to finish fifth in that race, being a contender. We know how good he is at road courses. He got the victory at the inaugural Indianapolis road course race. He got the victory at Watkins Glen when he was running full-time with JTG Dortry Racing, but Alex Bowman, not many people consider him a top road course racer, but here at Circuit of the Americas, always has been competitive. I mean, shoot, he was right there for the victory last year, and then an eighth place finish in the race in 2021. 
I really feel like Alex Bowman's a good driver to go with, especially after the momentum they've had. Yeah, Atlanta, he was not able to get a top 10, but it was a super speedway race. I don't want to hold that much against him for that. So those are my two picks as far as top picks go. Brayden, do you like those two picks, or was there another driver that you feel like is going to be running for the victory that we have not mentioned yet? I really like those two picks. I honestly, my other one was going to be A.J. Allmendinger as well. I mean, you always have to count him in road courses regardless of what car he's raced in, what team he's with. He's always been aggressive. He's never afraid to go out there and move somebody if he has to to get the win. So I love that pick in terms of where everything's going on that side. I would say my other pick that I would say more of a top that I wouldn't put a lot of folks to actually pick out. I actually like Brad Keselowski. I think in that board, I think he's going to have a chance to kind of keep things consistent. I think he's going to be able to finally run up there in an overall consistency standpoint. I think with the season, I feel like he's been a little bit down, right? He hasn't gone out there and kind of lit up the world. I feel like ever since he's, gone in there and started his own racing team and kind of working with everybody else that it's just been a little bit tough for him to kind of I think well, get his feet I don't know. Him. I mean top he's the only driver who's gotten top 10 finishes at every single race so far in 2023. You got to give him that and being a big factor at Atlanta. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of those things I think this year he's really starting to keep, you know, I wouldn't say get his feet wet, right? Cuz I mean he's been doing this for years and years i just think when you stand at it on that point looking at it from an ownership deal versus just being a driver it's a whole different ball game and i think finally he's able to get rid of kind of some of that overhang and just focus on the racing he's been able to go out there and keep his head down and i think that's why you've seen him go out there and compete this year and he's finally just kind of i think Brad is one of those guys that initially when he first came out, there was that whole rivalry he had with Kyle Busch, right? He was going out there, racing everything for Penske and just taking everything out and not, you know, given, you know, one crap versus the other on what was going on. He wanted to win. Now, when he switched to the ownership role a little bit more and it's kind of hitting the checkbook a little bit more if the cars don't come back in one piece, I think that made him kind of calm down for half a second. Now that I think They've able to kind of develop things a little bit more. He's felt a little bit more confident. That's why I think you've really seen him jump out this year and start to, like you said, he's been competing. He's been top 10 finishes. He was really up there in Atlanta. I love where he's going to come to it. So I would say that one's there um, as my, you know, one of my other favorite picks. I do have one other guy that I want to put out there, but I think we should probably save that for our uh, kind of long shot picks. Yeah, let's save that one for now because uh, we already got a good amount of drivers here. And if Brad Keselowski is able to get a top 10 finish here in this race, that will definitely put him in the right direction as far as his road course performances have been. Only one top 10 in the last two years. But guys, the momentum is on his side. Braden has said it really well. He's starting to figure out that role. And no one expected that six car to be in the top 10 every single race. But Brad Keselowski has been able to do it. So those are your top picks here for this weekend. We got the number one of Ross Chastain, the number two of Austin Sindrick, the number 45 of Tyler Reddick, the number 16 of A.J. Allmendinger. And in the last spot, you can either go with Alex Bowman in the Chevrolet or with Brad Keselowski in the Ford. Now moving on here to the pretty good category. These are the drivers you're going to put in your second, or excuse me, not your second, your third, all the way to your fifth spot. This is going to mostly take over the rest of your roster, minus the garage area. So these are some very important picks. Now drivers here could be running for the victory, but we feel like they're going to be overall top 10 cars. Getting stage points here and there. Going to probably finish in the top 10 overall in this race. These guys are the difference makers from you finishing near the top of your league to the bottom of your league. A lot of these drivers are familiar faces that you usually see here on the fantasy filler podcast as far as being top picks go so let's talk about them right now there's a lot of good drivers that can fit here in this mix but i'm going to include this first driver here because i feel like it is time for him to get a good finish here at this racetrack just bad luck but definitely track house racing they have gotten the relationship stronger you guys know who i'm talking about the number 99 of daniel suarez you, you know, early in 2021, they were still figuring things out. 2022, it was a bummer that happened to Daniel Suarez, but he led 15 laps in that race. Fortunately, just got caught up in other people's stuff, and he finished 24th overall in that event. 
Now, coming in this year, I feel like Daniel Suarez is still looks strong and competitive. Yes, last week wasn't maybe the best showing, but super speedways, that's just happens. You know, you, you could be right there in the top 10. You could be wrecked out from someone else's uh, situation that's going on out on the track. But Daniel Suarez should be looked at as a pretty good guy to go with. Number three pick, I think Ross Chastain is going to be the strongest car there. But like we've said multiple times this season, the teammates are usually not that far behind. And Daniel Suarez should be right there in the mix getting stage points and being in the top 10. Absolutely. I love that pick. I actually have him in that same category. I was trying to decide whether or not I wanted to have him in my go-tos or in this kind of back maybe compete kind of win kind of set up I, I love where he's at i love how track house racing has started to really go out there and not even make a name for themselves right they've already kind of figured things out and where they want to go so i love that pick um i would say one of the other guys that i would throw in there in that category for me personally i would probably put martin truex in there um in the toyota he did have a top 10 finish in one of the races um over the last two years he hasn't led a lot of laps um, from an overall so and he but he does tend to qualify relatively mid-pack but I do feel like with his experience that he's going to be able to go out there being a past champion he kind of knows what he needs to do um, I feel like if he can catch a couple of breaks and we know we talked about the Toyotas having a little bit of issues sometimes on a road course but if he can kind of stay consistent not get in too much trouble I, I like Martin Truex with being somebody who I think can get a top 10 finish yeah, you know what? You're right. Martin Trex Jr. was hanging out there in the top 10, and he was a decent performer in the uh, 2022 Circuit of the America race. He wasn't the top Toyota, believe it or not. It was actually the driver who won the Charlotte Robo race, Christopher Bell. And I think that's a good segue for another driver you should really consider is his teammate right there. I, I feel like if there's going to be two Joe Gibbs cars that are going to do really good in this event, it will be both Martin Trex Jr. and Christopher Bell. Christopher Bell finished in the top three here in this race. Granted, he wasn't in that mix for the win, but right there in that spot, in case all three of them got taken out, he was in front of Chase Elliott, Tyler Reddick, Austin Sindrick, drivers that always dominate these road course events. So obviously they had something figured out. And don't forget the pitch strategy that they had at the Charlotte Roval where they won the race and they were able to advance on into the round of eight. Definitely have some smart heads over there over at the uh, the 20 camp. So I think Christopher Bell is also in that category, but I agree with you. I like Martin Truex Jr. as a good pick. I mean, he's always dominant at Sonoma. He does like road courses. We even seen at Watkins Glen. Why not have him here at Circuit of the Americas? It's totally up to you on which Joe Gibbs driver you want to go with, but I think either way, expect a good top 10 from both of them. Now, we're closing in with just two more spots here. I got a few Chevrolets on mine. Um, let me throw two drivers out to you. Kyle Larson, the number five. William Byron in the number 24. Both drivers mm -hmm. who have had a great start to the season, but you only can pick one. Who do you want to go with and why? If I only had to pick one, I would probably take Kyle Larson. I feel like he's got that little bit more of kind of the swagger about him, right? And when it comes to the races, out of the two races, he's had a top five finish when that one where I don't think Byron has anything from there. His average finish isn't as high as you would expect it to be but i just think kyle larson has kind of a little bit less of that fear factor and i think from that even comes back from his dirt racing days when he goes out there in the sprint cars and just doesn't have the fear i think william byron i think with the last two races and him getting already two wins this season i think that's already going to boost his confidence so i don't think you're going to make a bad decision going either direction to be honest with you but my gut tends to go with kyle larson just because of the dominance that he's had over the last couple of years, I figure he would be able to go out there and compete and have just a little bit more kind of, kind of oomph, I think, when it comes to that. But I, I would love to see William Byron do it. But if I had to pick, I'd probably go Larson over Byron. I'm not against that. Even though I'm a huge William Byron fan, I do got to agree with yes, you that you Kyle Larson. Yes, I am. 24, baby, all the way. But Kyle Larson, definitely my second favorite driver. And when it comes to road courses, I mean, he's the strongest guy. He really is when it comes to the Henry camp. Maybe mine is Chase Elliott, but we don't got to worry about that because Chase Elliott, unfortunately, is not in that number nine car. But Kyle Larson, multiple victories at Watkins Glen. He's gotten a victory at the Charlotte Roval. 
got a victory at Sonoma, was a close competitor at Circuit of the Americas in the first race where he led four laps. I can't quite remember what happened to him in the 2022 race where he finished 29th, but he was still... Uh, was he able to get stage points? I think he was in stage one. So I don't know what exactly happened to him. Maybe the strategy's just not worked out for him because he also had Chase Briscoe back there. Anyways, Kyle Larson wanting to get his first win. He's definitely hunting for it. He's definitely been close in the last few races minus Atlanta. I think this race, you know, he's hungry. He's looking for that victory. Big names at the racetrack. Kyle Larson, one of the bigger names in NASCAR. I think he's going to be a solid performer here in this race. And I would put him over William Byron. William Byron been close to getting top 10 finishes. You know, he's looking stronger here this year. But I think right now, if you had to pick one of the Chevrolets here out of these two for the Henrik Motorsports, you would go towards Kyle Larson. One more pick left here in the pretty good category. I got to throw it out to all the people here who are big Kyle Busch fans. Yes, we got to include Kyle Busch as a top 10 pick here for this weekend. When he has the right equipment, he is good at road courses. I know last year was a bit of a struggle for him with the Toyota camp. But before that, when Toyota was doing really good, he would have some solid finishes at some road courses. A fourth place finish in 2021 at Charlotte Roble. A tenth place finish in the inaugural Circuit of the Americas. Also a top five finish at Watkins Glen. A top three finish at Road America. A top five finish at Sonoma. Guys, Kyle Busch likes his equipment. And when he likes his equipment, he's going to be running near the front. I think Kyle Busch, you still got to consider him a number three, number four pick for your fantasy rosters. Even though maybe last year we weren't looking at him too much. He's in a Chevrolet. He's with Richard Childress Racing. Kyle Busch, I think, is a top ten pick. I would agree with that there. I think Kyle Busch, like you said, he's getting to the equipment. Anything, you could give that guy a piece of paper on wheels and he could still figure out how to get a top ten finish at some point, I think. but. I agree with that there, and, and I'll, I'll throw another one out there since you're going a little Chevrolet heavy. I think I might as well go a little on the Toyota side. One of the other guys that I would say that's going to be a good one to look out for, I think it's going to be Eric Jones. Out of the two races they've had, he's had a top 10 finish. Wait, hold on a second, sir. Eric Jones is in a Chevrolet. He's in the 43 car. Oh, look at me go. I'm going back and forth. I'm still thinking he's still driving a 20 car. No, I'm that's now Christopher Bell, man, man. Cool. Let's go with the Chevy still. Let's. Why not? That still doesn't change anything on my pick. I still like the guy with Eric Jones. He he doesn't have the greatest starting average. He usually sits right about 30th as of right now, but his average finish is a 12th place. So that tells me that regardless of where he qualifies at, he has the ability to go through the field. He has the ability to go out there and make passes and figure out how to pick guys off one by one and make things work. So apologize for my blunder there and uh you know the old 43 car no disrespect to those guys but uh eric jones i do think is another really good guy to uh look out for yep you know what eric jones not a bad pick at all always flirting around with the top 10 and you know what that's why he should be a considered category here in the top 10 i mean if he's able to get the stage points here and there he's going to be a good factor and He's also going to have his boss out there on the racetrack, and you know damn well they're going to have some good equipment out there if Jimmy Johnson's on the racetrack for them. So those are the guys in the pretty good category. We got the number 99 of Daniel Suarez, the number 19 of Martin Trex Jr., the number 20 of Christopher Bell, the number 5 of Kyle Larson, and you can go with either the number 8 of Kyle Busch or the Toyota number 43, wink, wink, of <laughs> Eric Jones. Now we're going to wrap things up here with the drivers you want to take a gamble on. These will be the drivers in your final spot in the garage area that you know you're not going to use 10 picks on here this year, but they could be very valuable for you, whether you're in a one race category where you can only use one driver in each race and you can never use them again. I love those kind of uh, fantasy groups. Or... You want to save some of your top drivers for later races because you feel like this race is going to be unpredictable. Now, speaking of one-time drivers, let's throw the big big names in here. I'm talking about Jordan Taylor in the 9, Jimmy Johnson in the 84. You also have Jensen Button in the 15 and Kimi Raikkonen in the 91. Top-tier drivers from every single class that they're a part of. The Formula 1 champions, the IMSA champion, and of course the 7-time champion, Brayden. I'm going to give you the tough decision here. You have those four drivers. Which one are you going to go with in your garage area for a driver to take a gamble on? 
I'm going to go with Jordan Taylor. I Him coming from the IMSA series and racing on the Circuit of the Americas track, he goes out there and he can drive anything you put him in. But the biggest reason I like Jordan Taylor the most, again, he's in Hendrick's equipment. He's going to go out there. He can compete. He has a really good car underneath him. But my biggest thing is that he's also been the guy that's been helping Hendricks and everybody test for their Lamar car that they're going to try to run this year over the 24 hours of Lamar. That's basically been a modified next gen NASCAR, just, you know, different gearboxes, things like that. Right. But just from an overall standpoint, he's had the most experience other than Jimmy Johnson, of course, when it comes to driving these NASCARs compared to Jensen Button and uh, Kimi Raikkonen. I think he's going to be able to go out there and do really well. And he's going to have that, you know, fearless driving. He's not going to care to go out there and do it. Of course, he's not going to go out there and tear up equipment, you know, and piss people off. But he's going to go out there. I think he's going to have a really good race. And he's going to be able to kind of go out there and shake things up, make things interesting, and go out there and have a great time. That would be so cool if you see Jordan Taylor lead some laps. And I agree with you. Jordan Taylor, man, looks like a great option to go with here. I was between him and Jimmy Johnson. No disrespect to Kimi Raikkonen and Jensen Button. Kimi Raikkonen, the only thing I'm a little worried about is just the simple fact that maybe he doesn't have nearly as much experience with stock cars that we have with against these other drivers. I, I feel like he can easily run in the top 15. But as far as scoring stage points, I think those other two drivers are head and shoulders. Jensen Button, respect to Rick Rare Racing, love those guys to death. They're just not at the same level. And I know this car is mostly going to be ran under a Stuart Haas racing tent. They're still technically qualified as Rick Rare Racing. So not the strongest equipment in the world, but I still feel like he can still finish in the top 20. With that being said, we want top 10 drivers in our fantasy lineup here. And Jordan Taylor or Jimmy Johnson, I think, would be great picks. And man, if Jordan Taylor does good in this race, how cool would that be? I think if Jordan Taylor is able to finish in the top five, I don't know if he's going to be able to. Well, but he does have the right equipment. But let's say he's able to. This opens the door for many teams to have some drivers just do some one-off races that you would never expect to run in NASCAR to run at one of these road course events. It would open the door for many people to come on in, in my personal opinion. And if Jordan Taylor can do that in the nine, it would be spectacular. Um, We don't have any results for him in NASCAR in the past events, obviously. This will be his first time in the Cup Series, but... You know what? He's got the number nine car. He's worth taking a gamble on. I'll throw Jimmy Johnson in there. I I feel comfortable with Jimmy Johnson being a gamble driver too, just for the simple fact that he's able to be running around the top 10 when he was competing at road course events. He's a good road course racer. Everyone talks about Chase Elliott, Kyle Larson, Jeff Gordon. Jimmy Johnson was right there in that mix. Maybe not, not at the same level, but still a quality driver to go with. So, I think if you want to go with both the 9 and the 84th, your 5th and 6th pick, boy, you're a gambling fool, but I don't think it's going to be a bad gamble at the same time. Three more drivers to take a gamble on here. We got many options to go with. I'm just looking through my chart of all the drivers here on the entry list. Let's include some more safer picks, but still drivers that you're probably not going to use all 10 picks with. I like to go back with the Fords. Let's give Chase Briscoe another try. Chase Briscoe, talented road course racer. Looks like Stuart Haas Racing starting to figure things out. They've had fast cars. They've just had poor finishes. Eric Amarillo is a perfect example for having some great cars. He's not able to be there at the end when we need him the most. Chase Briscoe, there's been some races where he just hasn't been spectacular. But we don't expect that from Chase Briscoe. We don't expect him to be good at every single race. We expect him to shine at certain racetracks. And I think here at this road course race at Circuit of the Americas, I think he's going to be a good driver and a factor here in this race. Although maybe not the most reliable pick just because of his um, high ceiling and high floor, he's still worth taking a gamble on. Chase Briscoe, still worth a driver to take a gamble on. Absolutely. I agree with you on that one. If I had to throw a couple of other guys at you, um, I really like Chris Busher as somebody that can go out there and maybe make some noise for what's going on. He averages a 17th place finish, but he might have a chance to kind of go out there and get a couple of things. My other dark horse, Michael McDowell, believe it or not, the guy oh, who's nice. probably not too, too, you know, concerned about being, you know, labeled a road course driver, but out of the two races that's been there, he's had a top 10 finish and he averages right there in the top 10. He doesn't necessarily qualify very well. But he knows how to stick around and be there at the end. So if you have 
some of you are maybe not looking to use all 10 races and wanting to kind of save a couple guys for some other races down the road, I think McDowell is a good person to throw in there right now. You know what? Good picks right there. I, I like how big you are with RFK Racing. I'm not against that at all. RFK Racing really made steps in the right direction, but their road course ringer, if you had to if you had to choose between one of them, has been Chris Busher just last year. A sixth place finish at the Charlotte Roval, ninth place finish at Watkins Glen. He finished in the top ten at the Indianapolis Road Course, and his car was on freaking fire in the middle of the race. Still got the top ten finish. <laughs> it's a freaking unbelievable story. Nobody hardly talks talks about that but at least i remember that a sixth place finish at road america a second place finish at sonoma guys chris busher is great at road courses give the dude a chance especially with the team being stronger and michael mcdowell it's been a rough 2023 start it really has been you can definitely tell them losing their crew chief was has basically um, affected the team in a negative way. Blake Harris was their crew chief. Now it's moved on over to uh, Alex Bowman, who we've seen the results. Top 10 finishes almost at every single racetrack. But Michael McDowell still should be considered a great dark horse when it comes to road course races. He, he really likes this track. Average finish, 10th place in the last two races at Circuit of the Americas. A 13th place finish and a 7th place finish. And hey, top 10s at Watkins Glen, Indianapolis Road Course, Road America. Top 3 finish at Sonoma. And also, let's throw in the Daytona Road Course, since yes, we had two races there. 8th and 10th. I mean, we're not going to use Michael McDowell that much this season. Might be a good idea to take a gamble on him. I'm going to throw one more driver in because I think people may be a little worried about Michael McDowell, which I understand. When you miss that crew chief, there is an effect. Don't believe me? Look at Jimmy Johnson and Chuck announced. After they split up, one victory between them in the, in the last few years that they were in NASCAR Cup Series in their positions. So let's throw one more driver in. I really want to throw this driver in. Austin Dillon in the number three. Nobody's thinking about Austin Dillon when it comes to road courses, and I get it. He's not a driver who stands out to me when you look at his charts. Here at Circuit of the Americas, though, he may qualify around the 20th position. He's been finding ways to finish in the top 10. And if you find a safe pick to go with, you want them there on the sideline in case you have a riskier driver. Let's say you throw Jordan Taylor and Jimmy Johnson in, and then you have... Uh, Eric Jones, Brad Keselowski, I'm just throwing random drivers who could have a great finish but a low floor at the same time. Maybe they get into an accident. You want that reliable driver. Austin Dillon could be that driver who fits in for you. Getting some top 10 finishes here and there. And a 10th place finish and a 12th place finish here. He likes this track. He has Kyle Busch. Kyle Busch is a very talented road course racer. He's talented in everything, let's be honest. But at these road courses, he's been really good too. And when you have that right leadership there, you could put on a really good finish here for this number three team. Uh, Braden, are, are you high on Austin Dillon or not really? And you could be honest with yourself. You can be really honest with this. It won't hurt me if you say no. <laughs> well, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I mean, hey, but I honestly, I, I don't know if I would pick Austin Dillon. I, I think it's one of those, I mean, it's tough to argue, like I said, over the races here at, at Coda. He's been fairly decent. I just don't know from a overall standpoint if he's going to be able to go out there and kind of compete. I feel like he has a tendency to fall back a little bit at road courses. I feel like with the overall, not that his car is not good equipment or he can, can't, you know, keep the car underneath him. I just personally wouldn't, wouldn't go that route myself. But if, like you said, if you need somebody out there that's reliable and can kind of keep things there, just in case you need a little bit more of a little help at the end, not a bad choice. I personally wouldn't do it, but never a bad thing. If you need a little help. You know what? I got a great bet that we can do here real quick. Let's do a little personal bet here. Since you've been kicking my ass this year in the Fantasy Filler League, but let, let, let's let make a gamble here. I will take Austin Dillon in the three if you take the number 43 of Eric Jones. I think Austin Dillon can do better than Eric Jones here this weekend. Are you willing to take that gamble? I'll take that bet all day long. All right, let's go. Eric Jones has let me down in so many bets last year with Armani with the Motorsports Ministry and Johnny on the track. He's killed me. 
But you know what? Now I'm against him. So let's see if it pays off for me going with Austin Dillon. Fun little bet there, but those are the drivers to take a gamble on here. We have the number nine of Jordan Taylor, the number 84 of Jimmy Johnson, the number 14 of Chase Briscoe, the number 17 of Chris Buescher. And if you want to go with either the number 34 of Michael McDowell or the number three of Austin Dillon, it's a good driver to take a gamble on either way. And one more section we're going to cover on here. I missed it the last two episodes. I'm so sorry, but this is super important when it comes to uh, fantasy leagues. And that is the featured matchups. You have four featured matchups here uh, for each race. And eight drivers are a part of it. And you got to pick which driver is going to be stronger than the other one. They just have to have a better finish. Doesn't matter about stage points. Best finish at the end. So definitely you got to really think about that. Here's the first featured matchup here. Michael McDowell versus Daniel Suarez. Whoever gets the better finish, if you get it right, you get 10 points. I don't know about you, Braden. I like Daniel Suarez. Michael McDowell, yes, great road course racer. But if I felt like I felt the most confident with, go with Daniel Suarez. Are you on the same boat? Absolutely. I would 100% take, 100 take Suarez. All right, perfect. So that's an easy one. So go with Daniel Suarez on the first one. Second one here. This one's a little bit tougher, to be honest with you. It honestly depends on how the Toyotas really... Um, if they improve or they stay at the same level compared to last year, you got the number eight of Kyle Busch going up against the number 45 of Tyler Reddick. Now, according to our top picks, Tyler Reddick's the right one to go with, but Braden, I don't know. Do you go with Kyle Busch or do you go with Tyler Reddick? I honestly, I'm probably going to go with Tyler Reddick. I'm going to take the Toyota. I'm going to keep him in this overall standpoint. Nothing against Kyle Busch. In fact, the odds makers right now have Kyle Busch as the favorite. Not by much, but just a little bit. I would say I think Tyler Reddick is going to go out there and honestly kind of not necessarily shock the world, but I think he's going to go out there and keep everything ahead of himself, stay cool, calm, and collected. I'm going to go with Reddick over Kyle Busch. Okay, I, I agree with you. I mean, he can't fall off that much from last year. I just feel like he has just so much talent here at the road course. you got to go with Tyler Reddick. Kyle Busch still one of the best here in the business right now of current drivers. But I just feel like Tyler Reddick's the strongest one at road courses. So we're, we're, we're both saying Tyler Reddick here for matchup number two. Matchup number three, this is a really good one. I like this one. A.J. Allmendinger in the number 16 versus Kyle Larson in the number five. I honestly, oh man, this is, this is hard. According to us, you go with AJ Allmendinger, but I don't know, man. Kyle Larson right there in the mix. Braden, you got to you gotta give them the edge here. Who do you go with? I'll have to go. It, to me, it's going to be all whoever gets a better starting position, if I'm being 100% honest. Depending how qualifying goes, whoever I think can start up front, I think track position is going to be key. I think that's going to be a huge thing, especially with not having stage breaks this race. Whoever qualifies higher, that's probably where I'm going to go with. But if I, as of right now, I'm probably going to go more Kyle Larson. I know AJ Allmendinger has always been a road course ringer, and he's always a guy you have to count with. But I just think when it comes to keeping their head cool and kind of the equipment to an extent for me, I'm probably going to go with Larson. It's very tough. It's, I would say, a pick em, but Larson is probably one for me. Yeah, you know what? It going back to practice and qualifying, that's that's definitely gonna play a factor. I really feel like it. And Kyle Larson showed more consistency as far as finishes go. AJ Almendigger has sometimes had better finishes than Larson, but overall consistency, Larson has had the better advantage. So honestly, guys, it's a flip a coin here. Keep an eye on practice and qualifying. I think that will be a big factor. But right now, we are looking more at Kyle Larson over AJ Allmendinger. And then the last matchup here, this one's going to get, I feel like it's going to personally be easy here. But maybe we have different opinions. Matchup here, the number two of Austin Sindrick versus the number 54 of Ty Gibbs, a driver we have not talked about here as far as fantasy picks go. But do remember, he was able to beat Kyle Larson at Road America in the Xfinity Series. Talented road course racer. But in my eyes, I feel like Austin Sindrick has the head and shoulders based on the fact that he has already been in the Cup Series much longer, so he has more experience. And I think out of these two drivers, even though Ty Gibbs is very talented, Austin Sindrick should be the driver to go with. 
I 100% agree with you on that one. This is one of those ones where it's kind of a sucker bet, right? You don't want to necessarily go out there and try to throw anything out there and go something crazy. I mean, if you're feeling crazy, go for it with Ty Gibbs. But with Austin Sendrick, I think he's going to be head and shoulders above what Ty Gibbs is going to do. Not saying that he's not a good racer, but I think it goes back exactly what you said with his experience and knowing what he can do out there. And Ty Gibbs still just trying to get his feet underneath him a little bit in the Cup Series. I think Sendrick is going to be the best pick there. All right, so we're in agreements there. We, we're kind of in agreements in all of it, so at least not too much arguments there. So those are our featured matchups. Here's the picks that we are going with here. We, we got Daniel Suarez in the number 99, the number 45 of Tyler Reddick, the number 5 of Kyle Larson, just by an edge, depending on practice and qualifying, and then we got the number 2 of Austin Sindrick. And ladies and gentlemen, those are our fantasy picks here for the Eco Park Texas Grand Prix. <laughs> And that will conclude our picks here on the Fantasy Filler Podcast. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Crazy Corrado, thank you so much for coming in. It's been a fun episode. We had some arguments here and there. And I really don't feel like I got that with Armani and Johnny and Will nearly as much as you did. We kind of bounced off each other. That was a lot of fun. So thank you so much for coming on today's show. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me back on, man. We've known each other a long time. It's great to sit here and be able, you know, kind of, shoot the crap about some nascar and just something that we both enjoy you're doing a great job with the podcast i hope you have a great time out there at coda with rss racing and just keeping everybody up to date and i hope you send me a bunch of pictures i'm jealous man oh man i'm glad you talked about that yes you heard him right I will be at the Xfinity Series race, not the Cup Series race. I could only do one or the other, but I, I got a great opportunity with RSS Racing, Joe Graff Jr., and Acel, um E Racing, their NASCAR eSports team. They were offering VIP tickets, and they decided to give it to me. Very blessed, very thankful for those guys. Again, that's Acel Racing. Make sure to give them a follow. Uh, really appreciate it, but hopefully I see a few of you guys down there in Austin, Texas. It's going to be a fun weekend. I cannot wait. So thank you so much, Braden. Hey, where can they find you at? What, do a plug on something. I know you're not nearly involved in NASCAR social media like I am or some of the other people, but where can we find you? Let's get you a few follows. Yeah, I mean, by all means, you can, you can follow me on my Instagram if you want. There's not a whole lot going on, but, uh, my Instagram handle is uh, Crotto281. Um, C R O T T E A U is the last name there. Um, more than welcome to give me a follow if you'd like. And uh, by all means, shoot me some questions on NASCAR and anything along those lines. And if you just want to sit here and give uh, Mr. Uh, Vanilla Wafers a hard time here, I'm all for that too. Hey, come on now. Let's be let's be a little bit more positive around here. We don't need people bullying me. I've got plenty of that from you guys. <laughs> but yeah, Man, make sure to job. go. We got to keep going your toes, brother. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. That's that's the one positive thing. Uh, at least I can be quick-witted. But yeah, go follow Corrado over on Instagram. And also, people do not know this, he is a professional golfer. So if you want to learn your backswing or anything golf-related, that's the guy you need to um, ask those questions about. Beat me every single time on the golf course. We had a lot of fun. Even if I gave him all the alcohol in the world, still going to beat me every single time. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great time, man. But yeah, same thing. Golf's my thing. So any questions, anything else, guys, by all means, let me know. All right. Sounds good. And you guys know where to follow me at. You can follow me on TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. Just look up Vanilla Wafers. I will pop up every single time. On YouTube, we just released a new video, Recent Injuries in the NASCAR Racing World. Got a lot of traction. You guys really did enjoy that. And seeing some of the aftermath, I mean, we talk about Kyle Busch's incident where it led to a championship. We talked about Eric Amarola, where Bubba Wallace was able to get an opportunity and how Eric Amarola was supposed to, it was, went on forward with Stuart Haas Racing. So there's some cool stories in there. Make sure to check that out. Uh, TikTok, you know all the stuff that's going to be going on there. We got NASCAR therapy as well as guest the NASCAR driver and also some NASCAR cards where we're trying to find Mario Andretti. Still no luck, unfortunately, but we're, we'll get there. We'll get there. And Twitter, you want to talk to me during race day? Always on there. Just tweeting whatever I feel like to talk about during the race is always a lot of fun. But we're going to wrap things up there. I have been your host, Vanilla Wafers, and I have been able to lead you to the front of the field. So why don't we grab that checkered flag, do some burnouts, and head on out. 
So you all take care. This has been the Fantasy Filler Podcast. <laughs>